now in the name of Jesus. First of all, we welcome all those that are coming in through YouTube to the garage. Lord, give me the wisdom to give, impart to others. Help me to speak forth with the anointing, Lord. And the word of God just sets us free, Lord. We should know the truth, and the truth that we know will help us to be free. And Lord, that freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So Lord, we, uh, we ask you to come visit with us in your word, open our eyes of our understanding, and help us know your will for our lives. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, all right, so we've been doing a how-to series. Those of you coming in uh, to the garage, this one here is on how to appropriate his promises. Now, I'm going to ask you, in the Old Testament, we have uh, different areas in the Old Testament, and one of the areas that, um, with the scripture, God picked a guy out of Samaria, out of Ur of the Chaldees. Can anybody tell me who that guy was? Abraham. Amen. Abraham came out of the Samaria. He was a Samaritan. Okay? He, he came from the land of Samaria, right out of the, out of what we call the, uh, the, the fertile crescent right there in the, out of the Garden of Eden. And he was really tired because we know that entire area had the, uh, had the Anaki and the, all these weird things around. And Abraham finally said one day, he said, if there's a real God, would you please show me? And we know the story that God shows up and says, I am El Shaddai. Amen. And God develops a relationship with him. Now, we also know that according to the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God spoke in times past in many different ways in many different times through the prophets to the fathers. But in these last days, was, or in these days, will speak to us by his son. What that simply tells us that God visited the Old Testament peoples, the believers, in many different ways. He visited them in a cloud by day to protect them from the, you know, the heat. He visited the Israelites by a fire by night. He was in the rock that spewed forth the water. He was in Aaron's rod, the part of the sea. One of the neat things I was meditating on here recently is God is so cool because where the Israelites crossed through the Jordan, what was the city on the other side of the Jordan? Do you remember that? It was Jericho. Very good. Denise, you get an A in there. All right, it's Jericho, the old, supposedly the oldest city in the world. There's 50 city, cities built underneath <coughs> Jericho. Now, we got to remember that Jericho was in the promised land, right? So crossing the Jordan into the promised land, the first thing is Jericho was a huge city. It was a fortress. We know by scripture and by the, the biblical report that the city walls were 40 feet tall and 40 feet wide. Now, who do you know could build 40 foot walls and 40 feet high? I mean, 40 feet wide, 40 feet high. Well, who was in that area that Joshua was supposed to get rid of? Yeah, the, the giants. These creatures that God says, get rid of them, kill them all. Kill the children, kill the animals. And, and everybody goes, well, why is God so upset? Because these were false gods. They were worshipped. They were cannibalists. They were Nephilim. They were giants. They were evil. And God says, get rid of them. Otherwise, they'll come back to haunt you. Like thorns in your flesh, he said, and goads in your eyes. And, of course, Joshua didn't get, get rid of all of them, did he? Nope. <clears throat> In fact, <clears throat> I don't mean to go off on this, but Abraham came from that kind of, of, of territory. I mean, my goodness, they worshipped the moon, they worshipped the sun. They had these weird Anunnaki fallen angels is what they were, came down. And, and so this city was highly advanced but highly corrupted. You know, we know the whole world got corrupted and then God flooded it and killed all of mankind except for eight. But that's another story. But Abraham came out of there. And what I'm saying is God promised to Abraham. And do you know that those promises are still valid today? So we know that God replaced the law 
with grace. A lot of people don't like the word replace. But the law was holy. The law had a purpose. The law was to point to the Israelites. You can't save yourself. But the law also pointed to the need of a Messiah. And the law was given to which, which nation? It was given to the Jews. And their job was to take the gospel of the coming Messiah, not the law, to the world. In fact, what is it, Isaiah 52, it says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of them that bear glad tidings. See, the Israelites were supposed to preach the gospel, but instead Satan twisted it for them and they preached the law. We know what the result was when they preached the law was failure. Amen. You can't run around and tell people their faults all the time. <laughs> hey, God... God promises you, you know, all this and all this, but you got to clean up all those faults. <laughs> you see what I mean? And you see the predicament? Well, what if I can't clean up the faults? I'll never get the promises? No. Everything God did has never changed. If you're going to get something in the Old Testament, you're going to get something in the New Testament, it's all by what? You have to get it by faith. You have to believe in God by faith. How many know we don't get People in the Old Testament didn't get saved by works. In fact, that's what's wrong with all the religions in the world, except for Christianity and Judaism. And you'll say, why? Because that's man's effort through works with Satan's help to try to get to God. Remember the Tower of Babel? The reason why God destroyed the Tower of Babel, because if it was a way for mankind to climb up and to exalt themselves in the realm of God. So God confounded their languages and destroyed the Tower of Babel. And of course, man's always been doing that. And so Satan gave man an excuse. He decided to give man religion. And man has taken that under the guidance of evil spirits and they have, look at India for a chance. Look at Peru. Look at the Aztecs, the Incas. Who was behind these people and their weirdness? These fallen creatures. The religions of man. One of the things that Satan still uses today, but we're going to get in the promises, hold on, is he changes the, the true believer, whether they were Old Testament saints or New Testament saints, to believe in God through faith. He tries to give the, a believer an alternative rather than serving God by faith, out of love. He gives mankind an alternative that they usually buy into. It's called religion. Religion makes us feel like we're getting somewhere, but we never accomplish anything except for maybe a large building and a whole lot more rules and regulations. But God said, hey, you accept my son and I'll accept you. Amen. The gospel is pretty simple, but man has always made it hard. Aren't you glad we have the Holy Spirit to keep us in line and keep, it, keep us on the pack or on the trail? All right, so let's go ahead and get into this. I believe today's Christians should be some of the most excitable, wise people in the world. Their insurance is paid up. What is it? Christ's mutual life. The benefits are out of this world. Someone say amen. While the systems of the earth are shaking, you know, everything is, is you know, tossing to and fro and failing, our walk should be solid. Because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is at the right hand of God, making intercession for you and I. We are a very blessed people, but we might not know it. Remember I told you, oh, a long time back, that there are two of you. There's an old man and there's a new man. Old woman, new woman. Keep that to yourself, Pastor Curry. There's an old person and a new person. And the old person is not going. The new person is born again, alive in Jesus, because they surrendered to God. Now, which one do you feed the most? Which one do you follow after? Are you still in control of your life? Or do you send, surrender daily, hopefully like many millions of Christians, so God can work 
through you all day long and keep you on the straight and narrow. Say amen. All right. So Jesus is at the right hand of, the, of God praying for you and I, making intercession so that we are a blessed people. So in the lesson, this one here, we will show you how to get a hold of these promises you and I have been, been promised. Okay, it is one, of, one thing to have the pie in the sky. Okay, but it's another thing to have a little steak on the plate while you wait. Can you say amen? <clears throat> Many Christians are living far below what God has provided. And really there's just some simple adjustments. For example, how many know that Christians should have their own language? Well, I'm not talking about praying in tongues. I'm talking about speaking in agreement with the word. Christians should not talk like the world, shouldn't cuss like the world, shouldn't speak negativity like the world. Why? Because it's perverse. It collapses things. It crushes things. We need to learn to talk the way God tells us to talk. Let our mouth be filled with life and our tongue with sweet water. Can you say amen? Christians also have to learn to walk. We have to walk by faith. Aren't you glad we're, we're not walking by our feelings? Can anybody tell me why we don't walk by our feelings? Because our feelings are fickle. They change. One morning we could be sad. One minute, one minute we could be happy. But how many know that Jesus is the same? So if we're focusing on Jesus, then we're going to be solid. If we're walking with Jesus, we're going to be solid. But if we're focusing on ourselves and we are walking by our feelings, we're going to be pretty shaky. Amen. So we, we got that. So it is one thing to have the pie in the sky. Oh, I can't wait when the rapture happens. But listen, we need to get things done now. You need God's promises manifested in your physical physical walk daily someone say amen so go with me to second peter chapter one in your notes verses one through four now remember this is peter and he's talking remember peter oh jesus i'll never deny you <laughs> amen and then when jesus visited him remember he got that dream in the book of acts and it says the, the sheet was lowered how many times? Three times, right? Remember that in the book of Acts, God, in, I think it's the 10th chapter, where God gives Peter a dream, he's hungry, and he goes up on the rooftop and he falls into a trance. And the sheet lowers down, it's full of unclean birds and, and animals. And, and God spoke to him and says, kill and eat, Peter. And he says, no, I'm not, not so. I, I'm not going to eat anything unclean. Well, the, we know what the lesson was. The lesson was, that I'm going to send you to Gentiles. Don't treat Gentiles as unclean now. That's what the Jews, their extra uh, teachings, and they added their extra rules and regulations. And one of the things was to treat Gentiles like dogs. God just wanted them separated, not to get all puffed up in religious pride. But anyway, so basically, the key was that how many times did that sheet come down? Three times. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? So God reminded Peter, and remember... You told me that, uh, uh, you know, that you would never deny me. And I said, you'll deny me three times before the cock crows. Now God shows up and lowers the sheet three times as a little reminder, Peter. Tap, 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 tap. Remember me? Now I don't want you to run around saying things are unclean all the time. I want you to run around and preach the gospel. That's what that message was all about. And, of course, the Italian band showed up when he came out of the dream and he was to take the gospel down remember and follow it on down and preach the gospel to these Gentiles normally he probably wouldn't have done it if God hadn't given them the dream so we have the promises of God they come by the spirit so Simon Peter this same guy Simon Peter, a bondservant of the Apostle Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith. So now Peter's on faith. Can you say amen? With us by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Now look at this next phrase, too. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. What does that tell you? That tells you that the more knowledge of God you get, Abby, 
The more God's grace and more of God's peace you will have developed in your life. But if you don't get in the word, you don't find out what those promises are, then, then well, well, how, how many know that there's a real blessing on being able to drive a car? Now, I know Abby doesn't drive right now. I'm not picking on her about that. How many know there's a great blessing sometimes if you, if you lived in the woods and finally you got a bus ticket and you got on a bus and you could, you could travel on a bus? Wouldn't that be a kind of a graceful kind of a gift where normally you walk, but now you got a bus ticket? Right. Well, many people don't realize what comes with our ticket of having Jesus in our heart. We have all these promises, but many times we don't have our hands on them because we're not aware that we can get on the bus and take a trip and we don't have to walk there. Can you say amen? So we can literally learn the things of God and understand the grace and peace of God through the knowledge of him. Okay, then it goes on in verse 3. And as his divine power has given to us, past tense, given to us how many things? Come on, read along with the scripture with me. Has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. How many things? All things. But see, now we're trying to find out what they are. Through the knowledge of him who called you to glory and virtue, by which we have been given exceeding great and precious promises. Remember, this is how to appropriate the promises, that through these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You see, by your body, your physical body, you fall privy to the corruption. But walking in the spirit, you rise above that corruption. So we find out by following God through faith that the promises of God begin to work in our lives if we don't slip off our faith walk and move into the flesh all the time. And so many, many a Christian fail or they get tired or they want to give up because they're serving God so diligently in their own strength trying to be strong they're, they're trying to be patient they're trying to hold on and you know what you're doing it all wrong you need to surrender you need to die you need to get a hold of God you need to yoke up with him and let Jesus carry you into the future but what's happening is we are still working hard to try to get ahead with God and we don't work hard to get ahead with God. We rest a lot and let God do the work. Can you say amen? And it says there is a rest to the people of God. But many of us will seem to sh come short of it. Why? Because we're trying to get a hold of the rest ourselves. We're trying to do it ourselves instead of letting God give us the rest and let him do the work. Someone say amen. All right, so let's go on and continue to read. And it says this, again, verse 4, by which we have been given, past tense, to us exceeding great and precious promises. So we already have them, but how do I get them manifest? That through these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped. You escape by walking in the spirit. You escape by walking in the new man. Can you say amen? <coughs> you might say, well, how long can I stay escaped? As long as you can stay prayed up, meet with God all the time. Being in the spirit is not hard. It just takes consistency. What do you mean consistency? Well, we meet with God every morning, say 10 minutes. You meet with them. First, you tell them how much you love them. Then you sit down and say, God, all right, work on me. Help me shut down my flesh, begin to minister to me, but I just want to kind of just, like I'm bathing in your presence, Lord. And I just imagine like I'm sitting in a hot tub, and the hot tub's God. And I'm soaking in God in such a way where he's shutting down all the lusts and the, the dictates of my flesh and my worries of my mind about things that really... I can't really do anything about right away. 
and all of that all of a sudden God begins to rise up in me and when I get up from that time with God I step out in the presence of God and that's where we, we start our day and believe me if you haven't started doing that every day start doing it just try it for a week diligently try it for a week don't be religious about it. Just try it for a week. And just have a good time talking with God and fellowship with God. And see what happens. I mean, even the first day you'll notice it. You know, the rest of that afternoon. But by the end of the week, it'll be pretty good. That is, if you, you don't disannul your meeting with God by, fear, uh, by I don't know, careless talking and, and gossiping and doing all those kind of things. In fact, most intercessors want to know why they're not getting their prayers answered. Check your conversation. What do you talk about all, all your day? Are you talking about others? Or, you know, you running down the country? Or you beating around the bush? I mean, you're getting all, your exercise all the wrong way, <laughs> you know? Amen. So let's go on. So God gives us these promises, everybody. But let me ask you, does God keep his promises to us? God is not a man that he should lie. Had he not spoken it, will he not bring it to pass, right? Amen. Let me ask you this question. Does God stand behind his word? Of course he does. So if there is a hold up to the promises of God, would it be on God's behalf or would it be on our behalf? Our behalf. So we have an example of how somebody appropriated the promises of God in Romans chapter 4. I don't know if in this lesson I bring it in. It's about Abraham, who was strong in faith, gave glory to God, and who received the promise. Remember Isaac? Yeah. All right, so let's go right now to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 20 through 22. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 20 through 22. It says, For all the promises of God are in him, yes, and in him, amen. See the term in him? What did we learn about the term in him? Can anybody tell me? That's right. If we're in a car, we're in that car. And if the car's traveling, then we're in the car traveling. If we're in this building, then we're in this building. We have access to the heat, the lights, the warmth, you know, the fellowship, the cookies, the coffee, good fellowship. Amen. If we're in Christ, what do we have access to? That's what God is trying to get us to open our eyes to. We have access to all the promises of God. We have access to all the kingdom. We have access to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We have access to the armor, the angels, the name, the blood, the word. We have access to all of these things. What, do, what does the devil have access to? Maybe to your brain? To talk you out of some of the things that, that maybe you don't realize that you have? Sure he does. He works hard in keeping us ignorant. Did you know there's several places in the Bible where it says, where Paul says he doesn't want us to be ignorant? One concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Another one's in 1 Corinthians 10, dealing with the types and shadows of the Old Testament. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. Uh, he doesn't want us to be ignorant about... Um, how to walk in the spirit. There's a lot of things he doesn't want to be without knowledge about. So he wants us as diligent Christians to get in and to know enough word that we know who we are or at least who we're supposed to be. And we, we'll, we can really relax and allow God to make us into that. How many know that a caterpillar doesn't make himself into a butterfly by himself? No, he relies on God. How many know you can't become a butterfly by going to all of the colleges and all the things on your own? You have to have the God's anointing working in you, for it's God who works in you to do his good will and pleasure. He that's begun a good work in you will finish it until the day of his coming. For it's God can do exceedingly above and beyond anything that you can think or ask according to the power that works on the inside of us. 
So the idea is you and I need to learn to turn our faith loose and turn God loose and the promises will begin to manifest. Hope you got that. Amen. So don't be a wandering Christian. Be purposeful in what you do. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, don't be a wandering Christian. Remember the Israelites? How many, how many days journey was it really from where they started, Mount Sinai, to the promised land? Can anybody want to make a stab at it? Well, most historians will say it wasn't that long. I've heard 11-day journey. I've heard two-week. But let's even extend it, a month's journey. How can a month turn into 40 years? Well, the Bible tells us because the Israelites didn't believe God. They constantly were complaining, bickering, moaning, and because they did, a month's time, or 11 days, whatever, journey, took 40 years. I like to say it this way, they got out of Egypt right away, but it took them 40 years to get Egypt out of them. And see, depending on how stubborn we are, God wants to get all those worldly ways out of us, but the only way he can is for us to consult him his word and to get into praise and worship. Why? Then he washes it out of us. You see, you have in your mind a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. The only thing that can wash out your subconscious mind is the word of God to replace those old bitter memories and hurts and pains and fears and anxieties and, and temptations in your subconscious mind is the word of God. So you got to get in the word of God to wash that and get the new application program called Jesus Christ and get it locked into your computer, your brain, and replace the old destructive programs that keep freezing up. <laughs> Good way to put it, modern times, right? Yeah. <clears throat> your computer crashes too much. I'm talking about your brain. If your brain starts to crash, it's not in the Word. It's not with God like it needs to be. See, in your, in your soul, everyone say soul. Your soul wants to believe God, but it's got stuff in there. That's not good. So in order for God to get it out of us, we got to consult the world, the, the word, not the world. We got to consult the word and get in his presence so he can massage our brain to get to let go of those hurts and pains. Listen, what your sister did to you back in the year of 2020, you know, 1919, whatever that was, you should have let that go by now. Don't hold on to those bitter memories. You see, that's foulness. That's pollution. Listen, how many here like to eat the right foods? Make you feel better, doesn't it? You know, I'm not talking about being necessarily health nut, but I eat good foods. My wife eats good foods, you know, and uh, I like a good steak and stuff, but I don't eat junk. I, I mean, I don't go over and eat somebody's leather steak that they don't know how to cook it very well. And I'm not going to pay good money for somebody who thinks there's a great cook and they can't cook. Hello? So I learned to cook. And the only way I learned to cook is I would have starved to death in my previous marriage. <laughs> so I had to learn to cook. And some of us bachelors and stuff, we learned to at least flip some eggs and do some hash browns and, and you know, pancakes or whatever is easy, boil some water. But the idea is, when it comes to God, we stop cooking. We start relaxing. So let me, let me give you a little heads up about Sunday. Sunday, we're going to be dealing with who we are in Christ again. And so we first got to approach God. We've got to come to God and yoke up with them. Then we have to sit down, learn to fellowship with them. Then as we have done that, we stand up and learn to walk with him.
Then after we learn to walk with them, then we stand. Why? Because the enemy is immediately going to hate us. So he's going to start releasing things that start ejecting us and, re and persecuting us and stuff. So having done all to stand, we what? We stand. Why? Because then God takes over and does the fighting for you. As long as you're beating the air, you're going to get tired. As long as you recede back into God and project him out forward and let Jesus silhouette you and come to the forefront, he'll do the fighting for you and Satan will see him and not you. And that's the kind of battling we want to do. Instead of screaming at the top of our lungs, Satan, we rebuke you and get tired and hoarse and wearing ourselves out. Some of you pastors, you, you've got congregations that are doing nothing but sapping all the energy out of you. You need to teach them how to stand on the word, how to be responsible, help in the church, begin to assist you. And, and if you, you don't, get rid of your staph infection. Amen. And clean it up. Because listen, our arms and legs are the people in the church that do the work of the ministry. The pastor teaches. We pray for you. We encourage you. But that's my job. Now the rest of us, our job is to hear the word, do the word, and get things done. That's how it works, isn't it? Now I said, well, well, you can't sit around and do nothing, pal. Do you think I'm sitting around doing nothing? You know what I mean. So sometimes the church just needs to be educated on what they have already so they can walk in harmony with God so that the promises begin to manifest. How many found yourself a little more healthier now than maybe you were when you're first a Christian? Me? I have. Now it doesn't mean you won't have a breakdown or your body won't try to rebel once in a while but you'll find out that the more you walk with God the healthier you get. The more with God, you find you're not trying to believe God. All of a sudden, you're trusting God in areas where before you tried to believe him. And you had fear about it. You see, so the walking with God, once you walk by faith and walk with God and you trust him and meet with him on a regular basis, the promises of God begin to manifest. Abraham is a quite a testimony about that in Romans 4. He said he was strong in faith. He did not consider his body being dead. In other words, he didn't look at himself. Nor did he look at his circumstances. What do you mean? His wife's womb being shut. She was being, you know, about almost 90. So she was past childbearing age. So Abraham didn't look at the outward circumstances. He kept looking at the promises of God. And you know what? God changed his name. And for those of you that don't know, God changed his name to Abram, father, to Abraham, father of many nations. So every time Abraham heard his name, he heard the promise of God. Hey, Abraham, father of many nations. That's me. Amen. See, and sometimes we do in it embrace God's promises to us. God promises you a long life, Marvin. And a prosperous life. Oh, so we changed to Marvin. Um, um, marvelous. Listen, I'm just kind of, you know, kind of making fun. So he goes, Marvin Marvelous. Ta-da. A reminder of God's promise to Marvin. See? And so that's why when we spend time with God, God reveals those precious personal promises that are directed to you as an individual. Remember, God is so powerful and so everywhere all the time. He can be personal with everybody on the planet and yet not miss a beat. We keep limiting our God. He is unlimited. He's outside of time and space. Yet he's inside of time in space. It's everywhere at once. So try to put God in your head is really going to just pop it. So take the limit off God and take him at his word and walk with him and watch the promises come to fruition or come to manifestation in your life. Are you with me? All right, so... And 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, Do you not know those who run in a race? All run. We all have a life to live. But one received the prize. 
Run in such a way, run your life in such a way that you may obtain it. Obtain what? All the promises of God. How are we going to run our life? We're going to run it right to the arms of Jesus and surrender. And then we're going to stop running our life. We're just going to start obeying God in running our life. That will work. Okay? And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or balanced in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown or a, a pendant or a gold medal, okay? But we for an imperishable crown, faithfulness, okay? Therefore, I run, Paul says, thus, not with uncertainty. I know where I'm headed. Thus, I fight, not as one who beats the air. In other words, I don't do it my own strength, but I just discipline my body and bring it under subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. Paul realized that, <clears throat> that if he didn't present himself to God on a regular basis daily, that his flesh would get out of hand. And in getting out of the hand, he'd have to put it back under subjection. Now, I've known person. I knew a guy, man, this guy loved God. He got saved. We got, he would mention the name of Jesus. He would just weep and blubber. And he would just gloriously, you would say, man, that guy got gloriously saved. But it was all an emotional thing. When he got his feelings hurt, he rose up. And it was like he never got saved at all. He'd get angry. And yet he'd, you look at somebody like that and say, the guy, he really gets saved? Yeah, he got really, really got saved. The problem is he hadn't learned to die to his old selfish ways. So somebody would stir up the old man and the old man would come up and step into areas and say things he wouldn't do. He even whacked his wife a couple times and stuff and things that he regrets later on. How do things like that happen? Because we're not taking God at his word so he can work the promises. We have to meet with him so he can kill the weed. What weed? I'm not talking about the stuff that they legalized. I'm talking about kill your flesh. Your flesh has the nature of Satan in it. When Adam and Eve committed sin and committed and ate of the tree, Satan's nature or sin nature entered into the flesh of mankind, separated them away from God. Death was passed on to every man. So when you and I come to God, we have to surrender our flesh and say, Lord, I accept you as my eternal life, as my Lord and Savior. A boom, God puts in a new nature and he shuts down our flesh momentarily. Now we need to go to God for instructions. We go to him, he begins to salt and pepper our flesh till it begins to die away. We meet with them, try to bring your Bible in with them or a pocket promise book and share scripture. And as you read scripture, praise and you worship and you meet with them, he keeps your flesh like a beautiful garden. He keeps your flesh weed under subjection. It doesn't get out of hand. You, now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm talking to you by YouTube too. You cannot keep yourself from doing bad. You have to have God in you and allow him to keep you from doing bad. You just can't say, no, you need that strength to then do no. You see what I'm saying? People say all kinds of things, but how many know it's the ones that follow through by their doing? If they say, I'm going to see you tomorrow at 2, and they follow through and see you tomorrow at 2, you know they follow through with their words. Somebody says, you know, I'm going to do this, and they don't do it. We know that that's, you know, that's not good. But going back to what I'm saying here is your old man will be a lot easier to deal with when you take him in prayer to God on a regular first thing daily basis. And you say, well, well, Carrie, you say that all the time. You say that all the time. Why? That's what God wants. 
The, did you know the Bible actually says that he that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And I'm not talking about the sin that will destroy you. It just means you keep missing it. Many Christians just keep doing the same things over and over. They're never analyzing themselves. They're never lining themselves up with God. And so what happens is they just stumble through life as a Christian. That's not what God wants. You should be purposeful. You should know where you're headed. If you don't know where you're going, you never know if you showed up. <laughs> Hello. If you never make any goals and never set any things, you never know if you're growing or getting anywhere. And so we have to be purpose-driven. 1 Corinthians, again, 9, verse 24. Do you not know that those that run the race, one receives a prize? Run in the way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes must do it temporal or with balance in all things. They do it with obtain perishable crowns. We do it for imperishable crowns. Therefore, I run, Paul says, not with one with uncertainty. Do you guys know where you're going? Where are we going to end up when it's all done? Heaven. So are you going to let anybody talk you out of getting there? How about yourself? You're going to give up your salvation for what's behind curtain number three? <laughs> Come on down, man. The devil says, okay, a couple of points I want to bring up. We as Christians can't just exist from day to day. How many know it's just not one day at a time, sweet Jesus? You got to have a little promise. You got to have a little faith. You got to meet with God. You got to do a few things. God wants you to do a few things like come to him and then yoke up to him so he can change you. Can you say amen? And then two, we can't wander around without purpose. People that wonder about everything wander around too much. They wander from church to church. They wander from this teacher to that. They wander from here. They wander from there. They can't even get a project done. They can't even get one thing done because they're, they're not purposeful. So let me encourage you to be purposeful. Thirdly, we must have strong convictions inside of us and purpose to lay hold of what God has promised us. Do you know what a conviction is? Anybody? I'm glad you asked. A conviction is what God placed in your heart dealing with you specifically. Like, I have a conviction not to do certain things and to do certain things. Now, Joe might not have those same convictions. His might be a little different. They're generally, according to the word, they're generally lined up according to the word. But inside of me, like, for example, God might have me do certain things and not do certain things according to my call, being a pastor. Um, so we need to listen to those convictions. When you hear the term, did that convict you of something? What does that mean? Does it mean you were condemned? No. It just means God put his finger on it and he wants you to deal with that. You're convicted. Like, for example, if I told Joe, Joe, um, <clears throat> tomorrow I'm going to bring you a bag of peanuts. And I didn't forget or anything. I just refused to give him peanuts. Then I'm going to get convicted of that because I did him wrong. We have a natural conviction inside of us that lets us know the difference between right and wrong. It's called the witness inside of us. And it's a conviction. So what it does is if we start doing things in the flesh, if you meet with God on a regular basis, but then you start to slip away, like the warning we get in the book of Hebrews, be careful not to let yourself slip away. You know, we'll get a conviction, we'll get a, a witness inside of us. Uh-oh. Make that adjustment. Make that tune-up. It's like hearing a knock in your engine in your car. Uh-oh. Or the engine light comes on. Many Christians today... They, they don't know, they, they don't, I, for some reason, they're not dealing with themselves before God. 
they're letting themselves get out of hand. They're, they're saying things they don't mean. And, and then when it all starts to collapse on them, they, they go to God and they're sorry and, and they do all that, but they're not following the convictions in their heart. If you follow your conviction, it will always lead you to prayer, always lead you to talk with God about everything. Why? Because God is the one with the wisdom. He's the one with, the, uh, with all the strength and the anointing. You're not. So I'm always meeting with God. Amen. So I don't get convicted of things as much. So I don't do wrong things as much. <coughs> Are you with me? <clears throat> we can't take the word of man above the word of God. How many know that's so? I, had, I have guys, you know, they'll prophesy on you. They'll tell you, this is the will of God for this and this and this and this. If God hadn't told me, you can tell me anything that you want. If it's not in his word and he hasn't told me first, then what you say to me, if it, if it doesn't bear witness to what God has told me first, I'll just shelve it. You might say, why? Because God does, in the New Testament, God doesn't lead by prophecy. In the New Testament, he only confirms with prophecy, something that he personally tells you, okay? He confirms it. Somebody else might come along and confirm it, but I'm not going to say, God told me to tell you to move to Alaska, and you think that that, that was God, and you moved to Alaska. No, no, not in the New Testament. That's false prophecy. Anyway, we haven't got time to deal with all that. So in 1 Timothy 4, verses 11 through 16, the, disi the, the disciplines of a champion. We're a champion. All of us are champions, even though we might not feel like it at times, or we might not be by others. You know, sometimes we, we blow it and we don't feel it, but we are champions. God considers us more than conquerors. We are champions. So if God considers us that way, there might be a part of us, part of us that is a champion, and there might be a part of us that really needs some help. And I think you got what that is. In 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16, it says, And these things I command and teach. Let no one, Timothy, despise your youth. Be an example to the brethren in word, keep your word, in conduct, the way that you carry your life, in love, being loving, in spirit, having an excellent attitude, in faith, in purity. Don't be a pervert. Can you say amen? 13, I'm just going to keep it simple. 13, till I come, give attending to reading and to exhorting and to doctrine. Give attention to reading the word, exhorting one another, and doctrine. Can you tell me the difference between dogma and doctrine? What is doctrine? Teaching. And Christian doctrine is Christian teaching. Now, what is dogma? Dogma could be communism. Man's idea about something. It's a dogma. It could be the club rules. Or it could be man's idea about God that doesn't line up with God. It's man's dogma. So therefore, Paul said in the book of Acts, it'd be better that I obey God rather than man. Can you say amen? And one of the things I try not to preach here is dogma. We don't preach dress code here. We don't preach how to hold and comb your hair and wear makeup, not wear makeup. That's dogma. It's not in Scripture. Hello. We want conviction. We want Scripture. Can you say amen? Because we want the promises of God to manifest on this side of heaven. All right. So, discipline comes for a champion. So, look at He says, then he goes on, do not neglect the gift that's in you. Okay. Which was given to you by prophecy and the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to everybody that sees you. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will also both save yourself and those that hear you. So we have to be consistent. Can you say amen? Hold fast to the promises. One of the things that Abraham said 
He says, I want to tell you, he refused people giving him rewards and giving him things. He says, I want everybody to know only God makes Abraham rich. Amen? So a couple of points underneath that. Number one, stay humble always and hunger and thirst after being right with God. Righteousness. Two, keep up your maintenance program. Can anybody tell me quickly what is CCM's maintenance program? Make sure you water the cat and feed the birds. <laughs> no. Make sure you have a time with God every day. Time in the Word every day. A time in worship and prayer every day. And relinquish your selfish control of your life for the day. In other words, don't control, don't control your outcome, but keep yourself in control of God. Can you say amen? How do we do that? Don't get out of control. <laughs> uh, let God control you. In other words, because we can make some big boo-boos. Secondly, keep yourself, your maintenance program. Thirdly, walk in love. How many know that love covers a multitude of sin? I went on my studies I've had recently, I've been doing a lot of study and my eyeballs seem kind of bloodshot. In, in my studies, one of the things that Satan is, one of his parts of his nature is hate. And the opposite of hate would be what? Love, right? So walking around in love with God's help, it has to be with God's help, because it can't be in your love, that's being God's love literally neutralizes Satan's attacks, literally neutralizes Satan's lies. Walking in love. The scripture tells us that love doesn't even notice when other people do things wrong. Have you ever corrected your wife in the middle of company? Huh? And, and didn't get told a few things? Look, love doesn't notice faults. Love notices somebody and loves them. God's love looks to the potential and not to the faults. What does the Bible say? Here's the scripture. It says, judge not lest you be what? Judged, right? Why do you consider the speck in your brother's eye? See? Why do, love doesn't look at specks. Okay? And you say, well, why, but why then do I every once in a while get corrected? It's because your speck is no longer a speck. It's affecting other people. You have to be corrected. Hello. When my life is running in such a way where it's affecting my wife negatively, she should be able to say something to me. Right? Amen. And I know she will say something to me in love. And vice versa. And same with you. You would say in me, because you love me, you would say loving and you would pray for me, see? And the same with me with you. But when you get somebody who's not walking in love, it's easy to criticize, easy to point out faults, easy to say, you do this and you do that. And you, you got to remember, as we sow, so shall we reap. If you plant correction all the time, what are you going to get back? correction all the time. If you want to be loved more, what do you plant? Love more. Amen. It works. And so love destroys Satan's works all the time. It's like light destroys darkness. Love destroys hate. You come overcome evil with good. All right. Let's go down. So maintain a joyous countenance. How many has ever had a rough day? Plenty of them. Going through all this stuff, and I'm sure many of you have too. <clears throat> but if you will maintain a joyous spirit, because our joy comes from God, not our day. Our joy comes from God, not our paycheck. Our joy comes from God. So we can actually smile and maintain a joyous character even if we're going through something. In fact, we are more mature when we do that than we are letting our face reflect our thoughts in a negative fashion. So find out what the promises are to you and lay hold on them. 
by believing and walking with God. Why? Because he said he's already given to you. Now to walk with God, they will manifest if you just keep focused on Jesus, you keep your maintenance program going, watch your, your behavior and mannerisms, and these promises will begin to just cleave to you and begin to just overwhelm you and overcome you. Oh, come on, Pastor Gary. No, I'm telling you, the key is consistency. Stop being a yo-yo Christian. Stop being in the flesh one minute, in the spirit next, in the flesh next moment, in the because that's what we call schizo. Okay? Stop being a schizo. Stop panicking. Get with God and let him just take all that out of you. Well, okay. I bet you'll forget tomorrow, won't you? Or will you? Amen. So let's go on to the next point. Stay consistent. Keep your word. Someone say amen. We have in Hebrews chapter 6, 1 through 15, I'm going to read quickly so we don't take too long because we're running out of time. It says, I therefore have having the discussion of the element, or leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ. Look what he says is elementary, okay? Let us go on to perfection. Not laying out again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Lord, I'm sorry all the time. And of faith towards God. It should be more trust now. And of the doctrine of baptisms. Baptism in the body. Baptism in water. Baptism Holy Ghost. And of the laying on the hands. These are all basic elementary principles. And the resurrection of the dead and of the eternal judgment. And thus, if we can do this, if God permits, for it is impossible who, who once, now listen to this, it is impossible for those who once were enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they have crucified again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs and useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. He's talking about the promises here now. Now, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed. How many know if your life produces problems all the time? Get rid of it. Hello, if you, everywhere your friend, you take your friend, everywhere you take your friend, your friend causes problems, don't take your friend. <laughs> don't make them your friend. And I'm talking about your body. You take your body to the cross. You take your body to prayer and let God kill it for the day. So that when you rise up, you rise up in the new man, in the newness of life. And you walk on in your day in joy and in Christ and in God. And the promises are manifesting. That's how you start your day. There's nothing hard about that. The only hard part is you doing it because of the curse in your flesh that keeps fighting you from doing it. So take note. Don't let your flesh wag the dog. <laughs> We've heard that term so much here recently. Don't let your old person wag your new man. Let the new man toss off your old man and meet with God. Say amen, somebody. All right, and so finishing up with the next point. Okay, the next point is, as Abraham's seed, you have the right to lay hold on all the promises of God. Galatians 3. 26 through 29 says, For you were all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many as of you as were baptized into Christ, born again, have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Would you tell the Jewish people there's no Gentile now? Okay, and the Gentiles, there's no Jews. Okay, there's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. God treats us all the same. 
And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Everything he promised Abraham, you get too. Because we get Abraham's seed in Christ. Abraham promises in Christ. Romans 4, 16 to 21, talks about Abraham being strong in faith, not considering his old body, the outside circumstances of his wife's womb, but strong in faith, giving glory to God. And when he did that, the promises manifested. Okay? So the promise was, I have made you a father in many nations and the president of him who believed in God. Now, verse 18 of Romans 4 says, who, Abraham, contrary to looking at his body to hope, in hope, what God had told him, believed so that he became the father of many, many nations according to what was spoken by God, so that your descendants might be blessed. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead because he was about 100 years old, nor the deadness, the outward circumstances, the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but he was strengthened in his faith, giving glory to God. How was his faith strengthened? He met with God and gave glory to God, so his mind is not occupied on wondering how God's going to do this. God's told Lynn and I, some great things are going to happen on this property. But I'm 65, she's 68. How's God going to do this? If we look at outward circumstances. But we are not to look at outward circumstances for the promise of God. We're to look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. So guess what? Satan will use circumstances. God will talk to you in your heart. If you got something out of that tonight, will you give the Lord praise?